Generics in C-sharp may sound scary and look scary, but the truth is you're probably already using them even if you don't know it. So let's try to talk about them, let's make them a little less scary, and hopefully add another tool to your programmer toolbox. If you're looking for something in particular, make sure to check out the timestamps in the description below. Now, if you've been using Unity for any period of time, you've almost for sure used the get component function. And I know when I first saw this function, I simply accepted the fact that this function required some extra information inside of angle brackets, and I didn't think much about it. A little later on, I learned to use lists, and those had a similar requirement. Again, I didn't question why the type that was being stored in the list needed to be added so differently when compared to creating other objects. It just worked, and I went with it. Well, it turns out that lists and the get component function are taking in what's called a generic argument. That's what's inside the angle brackets. The generic argument is a type, and it helps the object know what to do. In terms of the get component function, it tells it what type to look for, and with a list, it tells the list what type of thing to be stored inside of that list. Generics are just placeholder types. They can be any type. They can also be constrained in various ways, and it turns out this functionality is pretty darn useful. But why would you want to use generics beyond the built-in methods provided by Unity? Well, essentially, they allow us to create code that is more general, even generic, so that it can be used and reused. Generics can help prevent the need for duplicate code. And the less code that we have, the less code that we need to debug, and the faster our projects can get finished. We can see this with the get component function, that it works for any and all types of mono behavior. This one function can be used for all built-in types or types created by a programmer. It would be a huge pain if for every mono behavior that we created, we had to write a new custom get component function. The same is true of lists. They can hold any type of object. And when you create a new type, you don't have to create a new version of the list class to contain that new type. So yeah, generics can help reduce how much code needs to get written, and that's why we use them. So let's take a look at an example of creating our own custom generic function. I've created a simple scene with some code that generates a grid of random shapes. That's not the important part but I will include a link to the files in the description below if you want to take a closer look at that piece of code. The important part is that I have four classes defined. The first is a basic shape class that the cube, sphere, and capsule class each inherit from. Then each of these shapes, which happens to be a prefab, have the corresponding name class attached to them. Now, all these classes are empty and are primarily used to add a type to a prefab. Now, personally, I do this fairly often in my projects is a way to effectively create tagged objects without the weakly typed tag system built into Unity. I find that it's an easy and convenient way to get a handle on scene objects in code that feels more robust and reliable than relying on weakly typed strings. But more to the point, these types and these classes allow us to leverage generics. When the grid is generated and the shapes are instantiated, they are added to a list that holds the type shape. This is done as a way of keeping track of what's currently in the scene. And this could also be done on demand by using the functions such as find all objects of type, eh, which happens to be generic. But that isn't particularly performant, as find all objects of type would have to be called frequently. With that said, let's imagine you want to find all the cubes in the scene. And that's not too hard. You could write a function like the one here. The function iterates through the list of scene objects, checking the type, shape, and then adds all the cubes that it finds to a new list and then returns that list of cubes. And then you can imagine that we might want to find all the spheres in the list. And to do that, we can just copy the cube function and change the type of the list we're returning and the type we're trying to match. And again, we could do the same thing with capsules, copying the function and changing the type. But now we have three functions that do almost the exact same thing. And that, that should be a red flag. And worse than that, if we want to add a fourth shape to our grid, we need to create a fourth function that can find that new shape. And this is quickly going to become unsustainable if we add more shapes or types to our project. So there's got to be a better way to do that, and that way is using generics. The only difference between the three functions we've created is the type. The type in the list we're returning, and the type that we are trying to match when we iterate through the list of scene objects. We are doing the same steps for every type, and that is the exact problem that generics solve. So let's make a generic function that will work for any type of shape. We do this by adding a generic argument to the function in the form of an identifier between the angle brackets after the function name and before any input parameters. Now, traditionally, the capital letter T has been used for generic arguments, but you can use anything that you like. The generic argument is the type of thing we're using in our function, which for our case is also the type stored in the list, and this is the type that we are trying to match. 
So we can simply replace the particular types in our shape find functions with the generic type of T. Do know that we still have the type of shape in our function. This is because the list of all the scene objects is storing types of shape. So in this case, that type is not generic. We will come back to this towards the end of the video and add a second generic argument to make this function even more generic and allow us to search through any list and return a list of subclasses. In my example project, I have UI buttons wired up to call this generic function so that cubes, spheres, and capsules can be highlighted in the scene. Because we now have a generic function, each button can call the same function just with a different generic argument. And the result? We have less code, the same functionality, and the ability to find new shapes if new types are added to our project without having to create code for each type of shape. Now you may have noticed that I snuck in a little extra unexplained code at the top of our generic function. This extra bit is a constraint. By using the keyword where, we are telling the compiler that there are some limits to the type that T can be. In this case, we are constraining T to be a subclass of shape. Or more specifically, we are defining the generic type of T where T will be of type shape. We need to do this, otherwise the casting of objects in the list to type T would throw an error as the compiler doesn't know if the types can be converted. Constraints can be very wide or very narrow. In my experience, primarily with Unity, constraints to a parent class like we did above, or to a mono behavior, or even a component, which happens to be a parent of mono behavior, are very common and useful. Without a constraint, the compiler assumes the type is object, which while very general, there are limits to what can be done with a base object, and much of what you'd likely want to do will require more specificity. For example, maybe you want to destroy objects of a given type throughout your scene. This isn't too hard to do, but it is another good example of a custom generic function. To do that, we can use the find all objects of type, which returns a Unity engine object, which is too general for our purposes. But if we constrain T to be component or a mono behavior, we can then access the attached game object and destroy that game object. You can find more about constraints in the C-sharp documentation, and I'll include a link in the description below. In my personal game project, I often need to check and see if the player clicks on a particular type of object. And I often just need a true or false value returned if the cursor is hovering over a particular object type. And no surprise, this is a perfect use for a generic function. A raycast from the camera to the mouse can return a raycast hit. If that hit is not null, we can then check to see if that object has a component. And this is all pretty normal raycasting type stuff. But rather than check for a particular component, we can check for a generic type. Note once again that we need a constraint and that the generic type needs to be constrained to be a component. Then to use this function, we simply call it like any other function, but tell it what type to look for by giving it a generic argument. At the end of the day, it's not too complex, and this is definitely reusable. Now, as a somewhat tangential tip, many generic functions can also operate as static functions. So to maximize their usefulness, I often place my generic functions in a static class, so they can be easily accessed throughout the project which in turn often means even less code duplication. Okay, so let's return to the first generic function that searched through a list of shapes. This function can search through any list of shapes and find any type of shape within that list, which is great, but it's still specific to shapes. So we can go a step further down the rabbit hole of generics and make this function search through a list of any type and return a list of any type of subclass. And we can do this by introducing a second generic argument and we can call it T class as it will be a parent class and use it in place of the type shape. Likewise, we can change T to T subclass as it will be a subclass of T class. Now the renaming doesn't change anything on a functional level. It's simply intended to make the code more readable. Notice how the constraint has also changed and it itself is now more generic. To go a step further into our example, while this should be a very generic function, we might want to only use this function with lists of mono behavior. To do that, we need to constrain T class to mono behaviors, and we do that by simply adding a second constraint, like so. Now, so far we've looked at generic functions, which I think are by far the most common and likely use of generics in Unity. But we can also make generic classes and even generic interfaces. And these operate much the same way that a generic function does in the sense of including a generic argument in the definition, along with potential constraints on the type. For example, here's a generic class with a single generic argument. It also has a variable of type T and a function that has an input parameter 
and a return value of type T. Notice that the type T is defined when the class is created and not with each function. The functions make use of the generic type, but do not require a generic argument themselves. You can introduce additional generic arguments per function, but they will need to be new arguments. Also worth noting is that this class is a mono behavior, and as is, Unity will not be able to attach this to a game object since the type T is not defined. However, if an additional class is created that inherits from this generic class and defines the type T, then this new additional mono behavior can be attached to a game object and used as a normal mono behavior. The uses for generic classes and interfaces are highly dependent on the project and not super common. Frankly, it's difficult to come up with good examples that are reasonably universal. So an imperfect example of a generic class might be an object pooling solution, where there's a separate pool per type. If you're new to object pooling, make sure to check out my video on object pooling, as I'm just going to give this as a very quick, albeit somewhat complicated example. Now inside each pool, there is a queue of type T, a prefab that will get instantiated if there are no objects in the queue, plus functions to return and get objects from that pool. The clumsy part here comes from assigning the prefab, which must be done manually, but isn't too high of a price to pay, as each pool can be set up in an on enable function on some sort of pool manager type object, something like this. The pool class is static and is per type, which makes it very easy to get an instance of a given prefab during runtime. In this case, we are equating a type with a prefab, which could cause some problems or confusion. So just something to be aware of if you decide to use something like this. So it turns out that a lot of what can be done with generics can also be done with inheritance with a good amount of typecasting. And it might turn out that generics are not the best solution and using inheritance and casting can be a better or simpler solution. But in general, using generics tends to require less typecasting, tends to be more type safe, and in some cases that you're admittedly unlikely to see in Unity can actually perform better. To quote a post from Stack Overflow, you should use generics when you want only the same functionality applied to various types, things like add, remove, and count, and it will be implemented in the exact same way. Inheritance should be used when you need the same functionality, such as get response, but you want it to be implemented in different ways for each type. So there you go. I hope that was helpful and maybe demystified generics a little bit, and better yet, useful for you and your project. And until next time, happy game designing.